Yes, you ran that title right, and we're going to get into that because it's something that has been common in woke progressive Christian circles, but it is starting to make its way into woke evangelical circles. We have to know what is coming so that we can defend against it. Particularly, we can defend our children against it. We can give them good, proper biblical understandings, good, proper biblical hermeneutics, so that they can not only resist errors, but they can refute them for the sake of those around them. But before we get into it, you'll notice something interesting if you're watching a video version of this podcast. I'm going to be a black box for the rest of this. We apologize for that. It was an issue with the recording software, and by the time we noticed it, it was already too late to do a re-recording of everything. We had to jump into editing. I apologize for that. We will do better next time. Thank you. God bless, and let's get into it. Welcome to the Wikipedia Podcast. The Wikipedia Podcast is brought to you by Enemies Within the Church. You can find out more at enemieswithinthechurch.com. Once again, that's enemieswithinthechurch.com. And today we are going to be looking at a woke proof text. You know, sometimes the woke don't just completely make up their ideas. Just kidding. They always do that. But sometimes they like to try to pin it to the scripture. And so we're going to be looking at some woke proof texts today. Uh, but before we get into that, Kyle, how are you doing today? Well, I'm doing good enough overall. There's been a busy, busy couple of days for me, a lot of things going on, but making forward momentum. I'm excited to be here. And oh boy, this is gonna be an interesting one. Uh before we get to that, make sure if you know if you find this content helpful, if you find it useful, make sure you engage with it in some way. Share it so other people see it. Uh, leave a comment on it, like it, uh, whatever platform you're on, whatever it lets you do, do that. And if there's something major you need to contact us about, you can email us at contactwokipedia at gmail.com. We want to hear from you. We want engagement. Uh, you can go look at our videos. When someone has a question, we engage with it. We want to make sure that things are clear. But with all that said, Sam, how are you doing? And what are we going to talk about today? Yeah, you, you know, Kyle, I'm doing pretty well. Um, and I I mean, life has been really busy, uh, but I'm really excited to get into this today because, first of all, we're, we're going to be setting something to the right. We So we did this kind of with the David and, and I almost said Bathsheba, but the David and Uriah story uh, <laughs> that we went over. And, and we looked at that and saw how the woke went and they manipulate and they twist that. Um, mm -hmm. but this is one that I had never heard before until my parents actually brought this up to me, uh, because mm. they'd heard somebody go and say this as a speaker at a camp who was, they were preaching. We'll bring that up a little bit later, but this is something that it might sound crazy to you. You, you know, if, if you're in a sound church, you might be going, what, <laughs> but this is something that is trying to infiltrate churches. It's probably infiltrated a lot of your friends' churches, and it's something that you're going to need to know how to combat with Scripture and, of course, to be able to recognize it and to point out the errors in it. Um, yeah. And what we're going to be looking at is uh, Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch, but specifically what the woke try to do, if I'm just gonna make it as simple as possible, is they try to equate eunuchs to the modern day transgender. Is that fair? Well, no, it's not fair, but uh... <laughs> good, call. good call. It's not fair. But but is that no, a fair it, representation of what they're trying to do? Th that's a fair representation representation of what they're trying to do, and they do it in a couple different ways, and we'll talk about that. They're not always saying it's a one to one situation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're saying it's an analogy, uh, but they're they're trying to make a connection between the two, between eunuch and modern transgender. There's also a key reason we're saying modern transgender. Mm -hmm. But how do you think we should start this off, Sam? You, you know, I think we should just look at the text because, I mean, our foundation mm -hmm. is, is scripture. We're not using this as a proof text. 
We just want scripture to say what scripture says, and we want to believe scripture at what it says. Um, so I'll, if you're okay, I'll go ahead and just read uh, Acts chapter um, 8, verses 26 through 40 is what we got down here. And I'm reading out of the New King James. So if you don't like the New King James, you can grab your own translation, I guess, and, and read it in that. Um, but uh, this is this is what it says here. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and he went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all of her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. So Philip ran to him and uh, heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come and to sit with him. The place in scripture, which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before his shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, whom does the prophet say? This of himself or of some other man? And Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And so he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Now, when they came up from the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. So that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found uh, at Aztus and passing through, he preached to all the cities uh, till he came to Caesarea. Now, first of all, whenever I read this passage, I kind of have to laugh because there's a little bit of humor in this passage. <laughs> the, the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit goes and tells Philip, yeah, go over, take that chariot. It, and I just get the image in my mind that the chariot's just going down the road. You got this unit going and reading, uh, reading scripture, and you got Philip over there just running beside him like, hey, do you know what? What you're reading there? I don't really hey, do think you know that's... you're keeping up with my chariot? Right. I don't know if that's really quite how that went down, but I would like to believe that's how it went down because that would be tremendous if that's what was going on. Um, but are you convinced now after reading this that uh, eunuchs are the same as transgenders, modern day transgenders? No, not in the slightest. Uh, but we, we read the text, man. We read the text. There, there's nothing there. Like, we're not talking about a, a jump. We're not talking about a leap. We're talking about someone getting in a helicopter and flying to another continent. Yeah. That's, that's what's going on with that, with this interpretation. Um, <laughs> I, now... <laughs> Could it be that it is an analogy? Maybe it's not literally that eunuchs are, but could it just be an analogy that eunuchs would be a representation for transgenders today? Is is that possible? Well, what do you mean by analogy? I mean, pretty much anything you could turn into analogy with enough effort, but when it comes to a direct... Just as the transgenders are now, so the eunuchs were in the past. N no, that do that doesn't work. I, now you you touched on now, something. Now, if you want to say something like, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, well, well, you touched on something that I think is so important for in, for everybody to hear. You you said that analogies can be turned into anything. Now it needs to be said because people often criticize um, the interpret the interpretive principles that me and Kyle uh, employ 
because they go and they say, well, you try to take everything literal. Don't you know that the Bible speaks in analogies and in parables? It's true. It does speak at times with analogies and parables like Song of Solomon. Okay. Nobody really thinks that Solomon's wife had a neck that was actually a tower or teeth that were goats. Nobody thinks that. And if they do, they're dumb. That Nobody believes that. But there is a literal truth in the analogy, namely that these are good qualities and she has good qualities. That's the literal truth. You can also see that in parables. There's literal truth within the analogies. Mm -hmm. And it's not it's not hidden from us either. Now, right. someone's going to get upset with that because if you go, well, it's not directly stated. Hidden as in inaccessible. Right. It's designed for us as the as readers, specifically Christians. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the ability to understand spiritual things. The meaning's not hidden. It's there specifically for us to get the meaning. Right. N now, should we even touch on, to start with, why somebody would compare a eunuch to a transgender? Like, we, we should probably... Do, do you want to save that for their own words, or do we want to kind of point that out right now? Well... I think the only thing to mention before that, it's not the only passage that they use for this. We'll mention That's true. Uh, briefly a little bit others. Uh, they also reference Matthew 19, 12. Um, they also try and make biblical figures like Daniel into a eunuch, which is technically possible. I mean, he was a yeah. court official. Yeah. Nehemiah a, would have been a potential eunuch as well. Yeah. But that doesn't, that has no bearing on any of this. That has no bearing on no. their argument. And, you know, if you if you rewind 10 years, they're making the same argument. And this is one of the things that, you know, you can turn anything to analogy. They're making the same argument that the Ethiopian eunuch represents uh, gay people. So they've, yep. they're just moving down the alphabet. They're, they started with the L's and the G's and now they're to the T's. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, let, let's give them, let, let's, let's talk about their own words. Let's make, let them make the case of why, why they do this, why they make this connection. Yeah. And well, and, and so another one too, just before we get into that is sometimes it's not just the L's and the G's and the, the T's. I don't, I don't know. They skipped the B in there, but um, sometimes they also get into critical race theory because I mean, obviously mm -hmm. being an Ethiopian um, you're, you're going to be black and it's, a lot of times really what they're trying to hint on is the intersectionality scale. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that's really what's going on here at all. So I wasn't able to gain access to this lecture, but in, in our notes, I have a graphic here. Uh, I thought this was fake. <laughs> you thought this was fake and it's great. Uh, so it's the ad for a uh, a talk, a lecture that was being given at uh, Penn State University. The title is Transgender Monks, Ethiopian Eunuchs, The Intersectionality of Gender and Race in Byzantium. So, yeah, if that doesn't establish the point that people try and connect to these things and connect them to intersectionality uh, and also further woke ideas, eh, that should be... An indication but let's go ahead and listen to a short little clip now th this is a person if i've had this question asked why don't you do any content on brandon robertson that's true yeah we have had that question come up but there's a re there's a couple reasons one is he's He's so far out of the spectrum. We focus mostly on wokeness in self-identified evangelicals, mm -hmm. self-identified conservatives. Now, right now, we're going a little bit outside of that, but not much, and we'll bring it back around. 
But he makes this point for us really good. Now, the other reason is because we don't want to give him attention. He feeds off attention. He grows his platform off attention. Mm -hmm. Stop reacting to him and he will diminish him in particular. Some people you do need to react to. But for this, he makes it very clear what they're doing. So let's go ahead and listen to his argument. Did you know one of the first converts to Christianity wouldn't be accepted in most evangelical churches today? In Acts chapter 8, we read the story of the Apostle Stephen baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch. A eunuch was a sexual and gender minority. A eunuch was either somebody who was born gay, who was seen as effeminate, or had their genitals cut off and therefore were either transgender or at least some version of queer gender identity. And he was from Ethiopia, so he was dark-skinned and African. Most evangelical churches in the U.S. today are white evangelical churches that tend to be critical of critical race theory and have a lot of racism built into them, and they're anti-LGBT. And yet, this Ethiopian eunuch was LGBT and a person of color. This was one of the first people God chose to bring about the gospel on the earth. And yet, most evangelical churches would turn their back on the Ethiopian eunuch. Whose side are you on? So I just want to point out right off the bat, and and this is another reason why you shouldn't take someone like this seriously, because you feed them. He's not an intellectual. There wasn't a single argument in there. It was a series of statements, none of which were defined, none of which were proven. There was nothing actually linking one statement to another. There was no argumentation. The point was to just say a bunch of words to get you to, and say them quick, to get you to believe his final point. Yeah. and Again, no argumentation, though. I hate to, you know, grab my pen and just burst people's bubble, but I'm fairly certain that if you were a eunuch of that time, it was not by choice. And it wasn't because you were born that way. I mean, it's it's possible that you were. It is possibly be born a eunuch, but the the type of eunuch that we're talking about that would be a government official. The the vast majority, the rule would be that you were made a eunuch. Yeah, and that's a key thing to remember: is definitions are important, but not just broad definitions. You need to know the specific definition that you're using because eunuch, again, you you pointed out, eunuch could be used of different situations and different people. The normal, traditional, whatever you want to say to it, eunuch, and the one that we're talking about with the Ethiopian in particular is a court official who was castrated for Mm -hmm. the purpose of removing sexual drive from them uh, and also to make them more passive and less motivated. There's been more than one uh, kingdom who's been overthrown by an upstart official. So right. you try and pacify them. And, and also, I mean, it's it's this idea of you're, you're trying to pacify them, you're trying to break them um, and, and put them in a position of submission. Um, under the king so that there is a it, not a loyalty but a devotion of submission that's that's there like it's mm-hmm. it's a it, it's a mind control or mind uh n- not control but a mind uh washing um type technique um essentially mm-hmm. and that's if you go and you look at uh Daniel let's just for for the moment assume that Daniel Shadrach Meshach and Abednego were also eunuchs which is is highly possible um, it, it, it could be that I'm wrong on that, but, but there's at least it's, it is it's, very much possible. Right. Possible does not necessarily mean is not a statement of percentage chance. It's saying that it, 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 a chance exists. Right. But, but if you go and you read Daniel chapter one, you see that they changed their names. They took them out of the nation that they were in. Uh, in the names that they changed them to was a cultural difference. They went and they taught them the language. Uh, the the new language there they went and they tried to even change their diet it, it was very much a an immersing and trying to change the way that they were thinking so if you're going to go with that idea of, of the premise that they were also eunuchs this 
this was very much a a, a forced thing. It wasn't that mm-hmm. they were going. In fact, actually, you can really make the argument they definitely were not looking for somebody who'd have been born a eunuch in Daniel chapter one, um, <laughs> because it, it says that they were looking for a, a physical peak nature there, which would mean for a young man, you'd have a lot of testosterone there. And, and so um, it, it's it, it's very much counterintuitive <laughs> to what uh, Brandon was going and saying with, with this. Uh, but it's yeah. not just the the inaccuracy. It's the point that he's trying to make is that most churches today wouldn't be accepting of the person that God chose to go and to spread the gospel um, throughout. In, 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 it, it actually surprises me that he didn't make this point. There, a lot of tradition would go and say that essentially uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was like the key player in Northern Africa and bringing mm-hmm. the gospel there. Like it's an extremely uh, his, it, like big figure within the early church. Um, it, like in, in great significance here. But is somebody who is forced to be castrated, does that speak to a person's uh, first, first of all, I, I, I'm, I'm going to go with the, the, the woke premise, not, not the way to, to do this, but I'm just going to go from their, their, their premise here, Kyle. And, and I'm knowingly okay. doing it. Does that dictate somebody's sexual uh, orientation? No, no. Does that, does that change somebody's gender? If you, we'll, we'll just assume that there's gender fluidity. Does that change somebody's gender? No, by their own, because this is a biological change, or not, it's a physiological change, not a uh, expression change. Right. So there's an, so there's it, a lot of assumptions that are going on there. Yeah. When it comes to transgenderism, it's linked to both sexuality, sexual expression, and uh, gender identity in their in their ideas both of which are absent when it comes to a forced eunuch. Mm -hmm. Because especially on sexuality, their sexuality has been removed. Now, some people will try and link it to, oh, well, I'm, I'm asexual, so I'm like a eunuch. Okay, that's a different conversation, but at least that one has some more consistency to it. it. At least there's a place where you could kind of go, okay, I can kind of see... I wouldn't even say a connection, but like you, I, I can there's see a where parallel there's a parallel that there. we could, yeah, we we could discuss. The tracks are moving alongside each other, right? The, but this one connecting them is not. Thing. He, it, Brandon, <laughs> you are assuming the Ethiopian eunuch's gender, and Ooh. you are assuming his sexuality. You're a bigot, Brandon. Ooh. Well, that's again, I mean, you looking at their own logic, the way they use it falls apart. Right. But then it just gets worse and worse the more you examine it and the more you examine it through the biblical lens. Because again, we're talking about people who are not, uh, they were forced into this, into a physiological change, but one that doesn't change fundamentally, it doesn't change who they are. Right. It doesn't change their role or responsibility to God. The fact that it, it was important, God was sending a message by converting the Ethiopian eunuch. That's true. There are many other converts that aren't recorded. So we're not mm-hmm. even saying that he himself is super special just because it's him, although he was an important official and that had ramifications that we know historically. But he was specifically chosen to be recorded in the Bible, his conversion, and in a dramatic fashion of bringing Philip way out of his way and mm-hmm. then uh, dramatically removing him, teleporting him a pretty significant different distance away from the eunuch right. to send a message. And the message was the fact that he was a eunuch was relevant. The fact that mm-hmm. he was an Ethiopian was relevant, even more relevant than if it was, you know, there are like Cornelius. Roman soldier. There's a reason that's significant as well, 
But Ethiopian eunuch, someone who's outside of Rome, right. is even more significant. It's a it's to the it's ends someone, of the earth. It's the gospel it's spreading. To, to yeah, the ends it's of to the, the ends to the ends of the earth, and no one is beyond the reach of God. Right. So what ultimately ultimately what is the 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 story about? Is it a story about an Ethiopian eunuch and Philip? No, but I, but I, I, I'm really restraining my belief in immersion baptism right now. Uh, as when you ask me, what is the story about? Um, because there's there's some <laughs> things that that you know, baptism can't happen if there's no water, and they went down into it. If you catch my drift, um, but. <laughs> I could only catch a drift because there was enough water to to catch the drift on. Um, we're... Yeah, rabbit trail. Uh... <laughs> uh, <laughs> it it it's it's really about the relationship that God is opening, the the veil being torn here into who mm -hmm. it is being opened to, uh, mm -hmm. because this is something that's very significant. Um, I, I know I'm skipping maybe ahead just a little bit when I ask this question. Maybe I shouldn't be uh, in where we have for our notes. Um, but Kyle, were eunuchs allowed to go and to enter into the temple for worship? No, they weren't. They were put in the same category as a leper would be put in. Uh, and we'll get to that. There, there's a verse that actually lays these out. But so when the Ethiopian eunuch, it, we'll say this comment and then we'll go to the next. We have another example. But mm -hmm. when the Ethiopian eunuch went to Jerusalem to worship, the closest he could get was to the outer wall of the temple. Mm -hmm. That's the closest he could get to God. And, you know, there, there's also people make arguments on. Well, that's just like how the church keeps transgender people outside the church. And, you know, it, it took someone blah, 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 blah. The, that argument is horrible because it was God who established the rules of the temple. So if you mm -hmm. want to say, oh, well, see, it's just like how we oppress transgender people and we reject them from the church, which one, we don't reject them. We call them in repentance. Two, if you want to use that argument, you're saying that God is evil. Right. Trying to understand the Bible. But right, let's right. stop that wasn't a man made rule. That that was a, a written down rule. And I think that, that yeah. is something that's that that's important, which it, we probably don't have time to really get into all of that necessarily right now. No. It's a good thing to talk about, but we need to continue on. So what let's go to the next uh the next example. You, you want to read this one? Because yeah, I can go ahead and so this I'll, comes I'll be from nice an and give you the one where Lady Gaga's mentioned. Thanks. <laughs> but this comes from an article called uh, When Jesus Agreed with Lady Gaga, What the Bible Says About Transgender Persons by Mark Olmsted. Uh, it comes from Huffington Post. I refuse to call it Huff Post because that's the most ridiculous name. But uh, let's read an excerpt from this. Jesus says eunuchs may be divided into three categories, born that way, made that way by other men, castrated, or that way by choice, i.e. the intentionally celibate, a common choice of members of many religious sects in the time of Christ. Uh, it is the first category that struck me, born so from the mother's womb. To cite another religious scholar slash major diva, Lady Gaga some people are just born that way. <laughs> One can assume he was certainly referring to the biologically intersexed, previously known as hermaphrodites, uh, but it is not remotely a stretch to conclude that he cast a much wider net. After all, the transgendered have always been with, with us, treated differently according to local culture for sure, in the same way that boys who liked boys and girls who liked girls raised eyebrows in some places and caused no one to blink uh, in others. However they get there, 
Jesus clearly has the same suggestion in how to treat them. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. The Nashville statement issued by evangelicals this week is the same old bull excrement uh, appropriation of the Bible to justify modern tribal prejudices. Normally, I reject the very notion of using this sweeping work of historical fiction to justify anything, but in this case, I'm gladly raising their Leviticus with a Matthew, and from the mouth of our Lord Jesus and Savior Jesus Christ himself, no less. There it is in black and white. People who do not fit in traditional categories of uh, a anatomy. I totally lost my line. Uh, yeah. Fit into categories of anatomy and gender expression are simply people who do not fit in traditional categories of anatomy and gender expressions. No need for panic. No need for demonization. No need, really, to make a fuss. In other words, to paraphrase Jesus, get over it. So, uh, Kyle, d- do you think that Jesus was talking about somebody who is born intersex um, or a hermaphrodite when he says that some people were born as a eunuch? I mean, I would say sort of, but not fully either, because there were, he's talking about people who were born with some sort of genetic abnormality that, you know, they were, they were castrated by genetics, which is more than simply even just intersex people or hermaphrodites. And even then he's, he's trying to blur the lines. He's trying to do the, the bait and switch where they connect intersex with transgender. Well, and Jesus is making a biological or physiological statement when he's saying that they were born that Mm -hmm. way. Then he goes and he tries to make it expand beyond any biological or physiological thing and saying born that way. And he includes the full spectrum of LGBTQ, LMNOP, QRS, TUV um, into that. And there's a major difference in somebody who has actions and thoughts, which would be what we would call the sexual, what they would call the sexual orientation, but we just call sexual sin um, of going and lusting after somebody who God has said, do not lust after. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, and I think we need to talk about this. Transgenderism today is not at all what they're trying to make it sound like. It's a mental disorder where you are born undoubtedly one gender biologically, and then you are going to a delusion, a dysphoria, and you go and you pick the other gender. That's mm-hmm. what transgenderism is. Which, in a way, you could link it to the, the born this way comment only in this sense when he refers to the when he refers to people born eunuchs he's referring to people that were born with a biological abnormality there is something physically wrong with them they are not their bodies are not whole mhm so that in that sense i could link them if you want to admit you know, if you want to, if you want to admit certain certain things to me, I'll admit that because then you're saying that transgender people were born with a mental disorder. So if you want to go down that road, I'll li- I'll let you link them that way. Now, now to be fair, if you're a man who thinks he's a woman and you get enough surgeries, you you might become a eunuch. Um, but that's by choice 
and it wasn't that you were born that way. It was that mm-hmm. you, you you chose genital mutilation. And which is a whole nother category of error. Right. But when we're we're looking at this, the the biblical eunuch, even in the sense of being born this way by choice and by um enforced upon uh through through castration, it, it's not the same thing because even the by choice, it's not that they're going and lining up and saying, Hey, Jesus wasn't talking about people who are lining up and going and saying, Hey, I want to go get castrated. I, I want to go become a eunuch. It, it, he was talking about somebody who is choosing celibacy in that in that sense. Mm-hmm. And, but even beyond that, you connect it to the rest of the Bible, and it's now. Now, some people dis- disagree, so be careful what I say here, because some people list it with the other spiritual gifts, and some people say it's a gift, but it's not a spiritual gift. Either way, the point is, it's not something that man naturally can do it's something that you a person was given this ability to persist in celibacy mm-hmm. for the sake of what the kingdom of god for the sake of ministry for the sake of not having the distractions that domestic life brings when you are married it takes up your time it is a good a right and a valuable thing but certain people have missions that god has for them that require a certain degree of flexibility. Mm -hmm. Paul. So he's gifted them with the ability to not have the normal drives and desires that men and women have. Exactly. So it's not a, a, it's not about identity, gender identity. No. (laughs) it's not it's, even it's, about sexuality either. No, it, it and that's that that's the problem. It's it's not about who they they would be attracted to. It's not about mm-hmm. um who or or who, what gender they think they are. It, it's about whether or not they have the, the gift of singleness uh that that you're going and talking about which means that they wouldn't be burning in their lusts. They've uh, they, they have a certain level of a contentment with the singleness that they have. And, and this is mm-hmm. something that I think is very dangerous. It's a little bit, it's, it's a major rabbit trail, but I think it is important to, to see within the, the liberal and woke Christianity. Um, they go and they try to, th- this is a really horrible thing that they do. Th- they go and they take those who uh, are confused and they think that they're attracted uh, to the same gender, uh, to the same sex, same sex attraction is what they call it. Th- that they're that they're gay or that they're lesbian, and, and and they're not. That's one of the things that we know is that they're not. They've they've been convinced of that. They're they're, they're wrong. Mm-hmm. It's sin that has come into their life. But then they go and they take them, and this is just a lie of the devil. I mean, th- this is this is demonic what they do. They have people who are lusting after somebody else. But it's the it, it's it's a it's a wrong thing that's going on, and it, and it's a wrong order that's going on, and mm-hmm. then these people come in and they say, oh, "You're called to singleness." Well, it's proof that they were lusting, that they were burning in their lusts. Yep. That they were not called to singleness. Yep. And then when you take somebody who's not called to singleness, who does not have the gift of singleness, and you go. And they they were uh, they were in sin and in disordered sin, and then you go and you disorder them again even further. You are tormenting their soul and setting them up for further sin and further failure, and to be just yep. tormented. Yeah, it, it's it's demonic. It, it's it's hateful. It it's is. hateful to do that to someone. You have to hate someone a lot to lock them into a place where they are only going to ever, you know, we'll, we'll be generous. We've had this conversation before, but you know, you bring it down to it. And even by your own logic, you're locking them into temptation. Right. But beyond that, they're, they're not experiencing temptation. They're experiencing desires. Once it goes into the realm of desire, I want to do this. That's beyond temptation. 
Yes. Once you say, I want to do this, you're already sinning. That's when it becomes sin in your heart because mm-hmm. you're desiring it. You're, again, you're moving from I could to I want. Right. You are. Should, anyway. Uh, sh- should we should we see what the HRC has to say? Yeah, let's go ahead and read this one. Let's be real quick with it and kind of, because I think we should go into some nice wrapping up thoughts. Yep. Uh, but let's quickly read this one. <clears throat> Up to that point, we don't have record of eunuchs becoming part of the early Christian church. But in the story of Acts, we hear about the Ethiopian eunuch who, after hearing about Jesus, asked Philip, what is to prevent me from being baptized? While Philip could have said that there was uh, no precedent for the situation, that the Ethiopian's ethnicity as a non-Israelite or his identity as a eunuch might indeed prevent him. Instead, Philip baptizes him with no questions asked and no strings attached. This story of a gender expansive person of color welcomed as one of the first Christian converts is a powerful part of our spiritual history. I I have a feeling that if the Ethiopian eunuch were to see that statement written out, um, you know, be alive today, see that he'd probably go full St. Nicholas on them. Yeah. Um, I, I, so w- once again, being a eunuch is not a, uh, a, a sexual orientation as they're trying to go and say, um, it's not a, a gender, a gendered thing. And I think it would be safe to say that the Ethiopian eunuch would not be holding on to that eunuch as saying like, I, I identify as a eunuch. No, I think he'd be going, I was forced to being a eunuch. Yeah, it's not It's not a subjective identity. You know, nowadays we use the word identity to be this, uh, this, this subjective thing about who you are. It rather was an than objective a hard, trait. Yeah. And so in that sense, it's not an identity. It's not an identifier. I identify as a a eunuch. No, it was a physical reality. Right. I am a eunuch. Can't get around that. But, and again, you see in this one, you know, you've seen it twice now. They link it to his, uh, him being an Ethiopian as well. Uh, They want to bring these ideas in. They want, you know, the intersectionality. They want him to be more than one thing. Uh, and, and that's that's not what that's not what the passage is about. Um, no, let's get into some of these verses to consider. Uh, what's what's the first verse you got for us here, Kyle? So this is going to help us establish the background. Now, now one thing we should say, because we sort of brought it up and then we we let it go, which is uh, we had the the passage from Matthew as well that was was referenced, uh, Matthew nineteen twelve. Uh, if you all you have to do is read verses ten through eleven. Mm -hmm. and you get the context and he's talking about we've already discussed this but he's talking about marriage that's the context he's linking the the need to get married with yeah there are some people that don't need to get married you would think of eunuchs as people because they have no sexual desire i'm going to tell you there's a third category there's of quote eunuchs which is eunuchs by choice, ones I have set apart. Right. So anyway, that gives context on that. But let's let's get another verse, because this is going to be focusing really in on the Ethiopian eunuch. So this one's Levit- Leviticus 21, 20 through 21. Or is a hunchback, or a dwarf, or a man who has a defect in his eye, or eczema, or scab, or is a eunuch. No man of the descendants of Aaron the priest who has a defect shall come near to offer the offerings made by fire to the Lord. He has a defect. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. Now that one's specifically talking about, don't worry, we have more. That one's specifically talking about the priests. But even the priests, if they they were a eunuch or they were a hunchback or a dwarf or any defect, a major physical defect, they couldn't serve in the temple. 
And I mean, to, to go further within the Levitical priesthood, there was a certain height regulation. You couldn't be too tall. You couldn't be too short. Um, mm-hmm. There was uh, age regulations, um, mm-hmm. all, all kinds of stuff that was going on there. And, and this is because the Levitical priesthood is a physical priesthood uh, that was a shadow and a type showing that the the high priest that was coming uh, was, and, and then the priesthood that he would establish the eternal priesthood that he would go and establish and bring us into. It was one that was going to be of perfection, but instead Mm -hmm. of going and looking at it as physical perfection, although when we get our new bodies, we will be, the goal would be of spiritual perfection that he would have, and he would be imparting that righteousness to us. Yep. And it also goes into uh, the need of a perfect sacrifice. We cannot in our own ability pay for our sins. Only Christ could pay for the sins of the world. He had to be perfect. He had to be a perfect offering. And that's why the the animals that were sacrificed, they also couldn't have any blemishes. Mm-hmm. So any if whenever it re- revolves around Christ, the representative, uh, when it comes to things like this in the systems, is always something without blemish. Right. Animal without blemish. Priest without blemish. Uh because they're all pointing to Christ. So that's, and that, that's part of the reason. That's one of the reasons right off the bat that mm-hmm. these, these imperfections couldn't be allowed in. It, now this causes a problem for their argumentation because they're the, are they going to do the same? Are, are hunchbacks and dwarfs now representatives of transgender people? Well, <laughs> I'm sure that they'd add that to the to the intersectionality list, but um, oh, they, they would. Uh, people with eczema, though. Um, <laughs> I got some acne. I'm now on the intersectionality scale. You have to listen to me. My truth is greater than yours because you don't have acne. Um. You, you, anyway, uh, Deuteronomy twenty three one, <laughs> it says. He who is emasculated by crushing or mutilation shall not enter into the assembly of the Lord. You know, Kyle, I I think this is this is one of the ones that was obviously picked on in a couple of the, although they said Leviticus, but this is probably more one of the ones that was picked on uh, by some some of the articles that we we referenced. Mm-hmm. They don't understand what Israel was to be uh, in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, that it is a shadow of the things that were to come, and it was pointing towards the things that were, were new. And so there's the spiritual yeah. uh, you, you know, analogy here, um, if you want to go and do this, or the spiritual shadow uh, that was coming, that inside the assembly, inside the church, you're not to go and to have uh, d- defects. Okay. So you're to go and to perform church discipline. So that's, that's one of the, the tracks that's going on here. The, the other thing to go and to look at this is that all of these defects that we're looking at were a consequence of sin entering into the world. Mm-hmm. And so it's this idea that there's this standard uh, of holiness that's being stated here and to be being shown that sin is to be set apart from the assembly of God. We're not to be bringing our sin into church with us. And and that's even why when you go to take communion, it it says, but let a man first examine himself. You know, before you get to church, you should be going and examining your heart, confessing your sins, and being prepared to take communion, to be in that unity with God, because that's when you're you're entering into a, a place while we're going and remembering Christ, where we're going and communing, finding unity with our brethren, but also setting our eyes on Christ. It's a, it's a holy thing that's happening there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, it goes into, it's another thing that is pointing towards Christ, that is pointing towards God's standards, that is pointing towards all of these things that if if God just starts walking back and making it, oh, well, we'll, we'll allow that, we'll allow that, the analogy falls apart. You know, they want to use analogies. Well, we use an analogy there. Uh, 
But this analogy will fall apart if it isn't done the way that it's supposed to be done. Now, it's not in any way saying that a eunuch cannot be saved. And, and, and by the way, too, with, with saying that it was an analogy, it was also a literal truth. They literally yeah, well, were I, not allowed. Like, well, like I, I do think that's important. We're not saying that this was meant to just be an analogy. And that's one of the differences yeah. uh, between what we're doing and what they're doing. They're, they're <laughs> saying that he wasn't a eunuch. They're saying that the eunuchs were the same as a transgender in many ways yeah. or the same as somebody with sexual identity, different yeah. identity. Yeah. Uh, but again, it, it's not saying that a eunuch can't be saved. Salvation, even back then, was still available to people. Right. Now, again, we have a huge advantage being post-Christ because we've, we've seen the, the fullness of it. All these these things that were pointing to Christ, well, now we have the reality, which is Christ. Uh, that right. gives a, a, a huge advantage, but that doesn't mean that God was incapable of saving people previously, and doesn't mean that a eunuch was beyond salvation. Do you have any proof of that? Well, I have, I have good proof of that, but let's go to one first in particular. Now, the Ethiopian eunuch was reading from Isaiah 53. Yeah. He said he, he had a scroll of Isaiah, and you know he... Scrolls were incredibly expensive back then. It's one of the reasons that we know he was a very important person beyond what was explicitly stated about him. So he had a scroll of Isaiah. You know he's going to read the whole thing. He goes from Isaiah 53. He's going to read the same verse that we're about to read, Isaiah 56, 3 through 5. And this is in the context, you read the previous verses, in the context of the Lord's salvation arriving. Do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Here I am, a dry tree. I'm not going to have any kids. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant. Even to them, I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. That's this is awesome. What agitates me so much about the woke nonsense is in their their rush to justify their sins, because that's really what they're doing. And they're doing it in the name of being inclusive. They're doing it in the name of love. They miss God's grace. They look at the eunuch and they try and read him through modern lens. Let's go back. Let's go a few hundred years before this eunuch. And let's read the verses that he was about to read that were yep. speaking directly to him. Not not him as an individual person, but him, his situation. And that he, despite the situation that he's in, he's a eunuch. He is someone who doesn't have access to the same things. You know, here's the thing. If they want to, in a certain sense, you could put eunuchs outside of the traditional gender binary, the real gender binary of male-female, because they are not fully capable of doing what a man is is able to do. They're not a third gender, but they're someone who doesn't get to participate in the normal realities of gender and sexuality. Again, not a third gender, but there's someone who is put in an awkward place, yet God says here, I'm going to give you a place and a name in my household. You are now going to be a part of my family. And it's going to be that, better than that of sons and daughters. It, and it's an everlasting name, which the big part of being uh, a eunuch is that you cannot pass your name down. Your legacy mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. not continued. Your posterity is not continued. And so God is promising a name that will continue everlasting for them. 
That's an incredible thing. Can you imagine being the Ethiopian eunuch, just got baptized, just understand all of this, that, wow, you know, this Jesus guy's pretty awesome. You know, he saved my soul. And then you get reading through that and you see this promise. I mean, that's incredible. And that's mm -hmm. how we should be viewing <laughs> Acts chapter eight. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be going and viewing it as, hey, this is a political pawn in order to go and to justify certain sins that we want to go and to normalize within society and to normalize within the church. But we're going to go and to do this and to say, look, you don't have to change your behavior. You don't have to repent. You don't have to do any of that. You can go directly against the, uh, the commands of God and the order of God. And we're going to go and use this guy to go and approve our text. That's, that's what the woke's trying to do. But in reality, what was happening here was that God went and he saved this man's soul. And he went and he basically told him, look, I'm going to go and restore everything that sin entering into this world took from you. Mm. I, it's an incredible redemption story. It's absolutely amazing. That's the importance. Not, not only is that the importance of having scripture interpret scripture, but that's the importance of reading the whole Bible. You do not read a a passage as a singular story disconnected from everything else. You read a passage with your whole Bible open. You connect it together and you find the amazing beauty of God's word, the consistency of the message, and it helps clarify the point that God is making. Not interpreting scripture by taking your 21st century idea and trying to shove it in and find a place where you can fit it in because it'll break it'll break the message of god's word it'll break your own uh ideologies it'll leave you in a position where nothing fits you uh, again we talked we talked about the the evilness the wickedness of telling someone who is struggling with you know homosexual temptations and sinful desires and saying nothing christ can do about that he can't do anything about that uh you just need to stay there you're obviously supposed to be single so you need to stay there burning your passions and have this sin fester inside of you like a cancer that eats you from the inside out until you either come to a point where you walk away from the church or you give up the sin. God, I pray that you give up the sin. Do not sit in that right. space. Well, I think we've seen the woke proof text here in Acts chapter 8. And uh, I think it's... And S Sam, before we end, yeah, we talked primarily about the progressive Christians oh, yeah. who are woke doing this. But finish your story, because you were saying that it's not just that it's starting to lead right. into self-identified conservative Christians. Right. So uh, my parents every year, uh, I did this growing up, went go to family camp and they went to family camp one time. And this is a, a Baptist uh, camp. Um, it within, not a Southern Baptist. I'm going to point not, that Not out. a Southern Baptist. We're not talking, uh, we're talking about different Baptists for once. Yeah. Yeah. Different, different Baptists. They're, they're, they're general and regular. Um, but it's it's a small conservative um, association of, of Baptist churches, and I grew up going there. And one year, the, I get this call uh, while well, my parents are at camp, which is kind of weird. They normally don't call me while they're at camp, um, you know, try to disconnect and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? Uh, and they say, D do you think that the Ethiopian eunuch is like a transgender? And I said, what? They go, yeah, this, this pastor um, it, it, uh, went and said it. And I, I mean, this pastor would be a, a conservative, or at least would claim to be a conservative uh, pastor in, in a conservative, you know, at least claiming a conservative church with inside of a conservative association um, that has never done any of this kind of teaching. And, and this wasn't that he preached a whole sermon on it. It was that he made a passing comment, a passing comment of, oh yeah, in this Ethiopian, um, that would be the like like a modern day transgender. 
Now, where did he get this idea? Because it's not from the Bible. It's not from any historical Orthodox teacher. It has to be from progressive Christianity. It has to be from, mm -hmm. uh, from woke Christianity. And what is he doing with that? Well, this is hundreds of people who are listening to him from dozens of churches, probably dozens of pastors there, or at least a dozen pastors there. There were, I know there was at least one Bible college professor that was there and just going and planting a seed of wokeness into their minds so that when they hear somebody else say it, when they hear Brandon say it, Brandon Robertson, what comes up to their mind? Oh yeah, Pastor Mike Augsburger said that. He, he must agree. And whether it was done intentional to move them that way or unintentional because he's getting influenced by these guys, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And a pastor and a teacher need to be held to a higher standard. That pulpit mm -hmm. needs to mean something. Oh, yeah. Well, I think we uh, covered it. Not even half of it. There is so much more that we could talk about on this subject. I, I mean, the last comment I'll make, and we won't discuss this, but there's a reason they want to go to Unix. It's because transgender, what we would call transgender, did exist back then in the pagan Greco-Roman world. It's true. And Paul called them to repent and to give that up. Mm-hmm. So, eh. but they don't like Paul, but we should probably wrap it up for, for this week. That's right. Well, now that you understand where, how the woke are teaching, what they're trying to bring into the church, be on guard for it, uh, watch for it. And of course, combat it with the scripture, um, that, that we presented, uh, to you use these arguments, go and convince others and keep standing for the truth. And remember, don't go woke.